Today, October 22, is a very significant day in the history of our beginnings. Alrighty then, welcome back to the Evans History Podcast. This episode is entitled Desmond Ford Part 5. Wow, I can't believe we're on Part 5 already. This was only supposed to be a three or four part series, and here we are. Okay, so last time, just to catch you up, we talked about the righteousness by faith controversy that uh, pitted traditionalists versus progressives, and those are my terms. And if you want to understand why I'm using those terms, then go listen to part four, because I explained it all there, and I don't want to explain it again. This time, in this episode... We are going to move on from the righteousness by faith controversy and talk about righteousness by faith again, because it's not over quite yet. And we're going to begin with this Palmdale conference. Now, the durable tension between Des Ford and the Concerned Brethren, that's a coalition of mostly retired pastors uh, who were opposing Des Ford, this tension between these two groups finally convinced Australian Division President R.R. Frame that this issue of righteousness by faith was larger than a few people in Australia. General Conference President Robert Pearson reluctantly agreed with this assessment. And like any administrator, Pearson did not want to call a meeting to deal with a problem that seemed confined to one corner of the Avenus world. But both the concerned brethren and the Division President were asking Pearson to intervene. So, 19 people from America and Australia were invited to Palmdale, a few miles from the recently opened Six Flags Magic Mountain. Ah, what I would have given to see Robert Pearson ride the gold rusher. Anyways, Team Australia featured R.R. Frame, Alfred Jorgensen, Elsie Naden, Bob Parr, who's the editor of the record, and of course, Des Ford, among others. Team America brought Ken Wood, editor of The Review, Robert Olson of The White Estate, Hans LaRondel, Raoul Detterin, Gordon Hyde of the Biblical Research Institute. They also brought Duncan Eva and, of course, Robert Pearson. Not to be excluded, the Concerned Brethren campaigned hard to get two of their number invited to Palmdale. The Australasian division refused to anoint any of them as their Australian delegates. One of the concerned brethren, John Clifford, then suggested to Russell Standish that since they couldn't speak at Palmdale, they could at least write something that explains their views and send that to Palmdale. So over the next six weeks, the two wrote about a 130-page manuscript and sent it to Pearson, Ken Wood, and Duncan Eva. It made no difference at the time, as these three church leaders didn't really have the time to read it carefully while they were at Palmdale, but the manuscript, later titled Conflicting Concepts of Righteousness by Faith, would make waves in the months ahead. The Palmdale meetings lasted a week, kicking off on April 23, 1976. At 7.30 in the morning, individuals were invited to meet for prayer. Two papers were then presented in the morning, each followed by an hour of discussion. After lunch, they met for another paper in the afternoon with another hour of discussion. Des presented two of the ten papers, focusing on Paul's meaning of justification by faith and the nature of Christ. Ken Wood also presented two papers titled The Historic Avenus Concept of Righteousness by Faith and The Historic Avenus Concept of the Human Nature of Christ. Des was focusing on what the New Testament teaches. Wood was focused on what Avenus have always taught. Des accepted that Avenus had taught that righteousness by faith was justification plus sanctification. He simply thought that that was wrong and it was time to move on from it. Hence, hence I call him and, and the, those who agree with him progressives. They wanted to progress on from what the pioneers had believed, whereas Ken Wood, representing the traditionalists, wanted to maintain the tradition. A.P. Salem did a word study on dikaiosune, the Greek word translated righteousness. Don Neufeld likewise did a word study. Raoul Detterin's paper focused on how the reformers understood justification by faith, and so on. 
Ford stood ready with a third paper on Ellen White in Righteous by Faith, but never had the occasion to present it. We know very little of what actually happened at Palmdale. We have the papers that were presented. We have some notes and anecdotes, but uh, not a lot of details like we will have for Glacier View later on. We do have a consensus statement that emerged from Palmdale. This was later published in the Review and the Australasian Record. It began by acknowledging that the phrase righteousness by faith refers to what they called the experience of justification by faith. It also mentions that, quote, God declares righteous the person who believes in Jesus and repents, end quote. This, of course, is what Des and the other progressives had been saying. Nevertheless, the statement goes on to say that the concept of the righteousness of God goes beyond the specific phrase in Paul's writings. The broader use of the word righteousness includes Quote, both the granting to the repentant sinner of a new legal standing before God and the demand of a new way of life, end quote. To put it another way, the statement says, quote, righteousness is concerned with both God's gift and his requirement, with justification and sanctification, with both imputed righteousness and repentance, and imparted righteousness by faith and obedience, end quote. Given this broader meaning of the word righteousness outside of Paul, the statement claims, quote, Thus, Seventh-day Adventists have often used the phrase righteousness by faith theologically to include both justification and sanctification, end quote. The Palmdale statement concedes that Paul's specific use of the phrase righteousness by faith means justification, that is, imputed righteousness but that this needs to be understood in light of what the rest of the Bible says and how it emphasizes the other half of the salvation formula, sanctification or imparted righteousness. Curiously, there are two other sections of the Palmdale Statement, a long one on the nature of Christ and a short one on what happened in 1888. As Gerhard Fandel would later note, quote, although only two presentations at Palmdale dealt with the nature of Christ, the larger part of the report dealt with this issue, end quote. It's as if the righteousness by faith question wasn't a big enough issue to discuss. We had to also discuss two other issues. In any case, the section uh, that talks about the nature of Christ is carefully summarized, and it avoids tipping its hand towards one side or the other of the debate. When it came to the section on what happened after the 1888 General Conference session, you should remember that Wheeland and Short, among others, had claimed that the church had rejected the special message of righteousness by faith that God had sent to the church through Jones and Wagner and uh, affirmed by Ellen White. And the Palmdale statement admitted that, quote, we recognize that a primary responsibility in this respect lies with the leadership of the church, end quote. In other words, this 1888 Righteousness by Faith message had been rejected, and that primary responsibility for it lies with the leadership of the church. That is the closest, I believe, the church would ever get to Whelan's desire for corporate repentance. I mean, at least the church acknowledged that our leaders back in the aftermath of 1888 were wrong, and, and so therefore we have uh, rejected that message that we should have accepted. The Palmdale statement, it, it was a consensus statement, okay? That means that all who were there had to agree with this statement. It wasn't exhaustive, right? It, it's going to paper over or ignore areas of disagreement because its focus is consensus. It was something that both sides could apparently live with, and, and they did for about one month. <laughs> consensus statements, they can be really powerful tools, that get people who are in the room together to stop focusing on where they disagree and to focus on where they actually agree. Beatrice Neal from Union College would write that, quote, the two sides are not as far apart as they think, end quote. A potential problem with consensus statements, as you can imagine, is that all of the controversial bits go unresolved and both sides can walk away saying, see, we all love Jesus and nothing changes. Or, as R.C. Sproul put it, quote, if two parties agree on the wording of a statement, 
but do not mean the same things by the words used. Is the agreement a real agreement? End quote. And that is a really pertinent question to ask about the Palmdale Statement, as well as other consensus statements that have uh, been issued in both Adventist history and in, in Christian history, right? So we could talk about QOD. If we are using words that the evangelicals understand one way and the Adventists understand another way, is there really an agreement? <laughs> or is it a, a kind of a superficial agreement? The question is whether the Palmdale statement, I think, was a, was a meaningful consensus. I think that's what we're getting at here. We can agree, uh, we, can, we can use language that both sides look at and say, I can agree with that, but they mean different things by that. And the question is, is that a meaningful agreement? Is the Palmdale statement a meaningful consensus? Now, I do think it was meaningful in that it represented some progress between these two groups. The progressives point that Paul's use of righteousness by faith as always indicating justification was now accepted. The Palmdale Conference was also helpful in that it brought both sides together in a constructive way for the first time. The statement also enabled Adventists who read the statement to read a synthesis of both views in one statement, right? So they didn't have to just kind of go read something, get a tape from Des Ford or read an article by Herb Douglas to, to understand both sides. Both sides came together in one place. Uh, you could buy the papers that were presented and you could you could read both sides all in one place. So I do think Palmdale was, was helpful in helping people who were interested uh, see both sides come together and read both sides and how they were addressing each other. Okay, so while there was consensus, I, I don't know that it was a meaningful consensus for several reasons. First, consensus statements like this ought to be the first step forwards, not the last. Given that church leaders didn't endeavor to build on this statement through future meetings, the progress at Palmdale was ultimately meaningless because it didn't lead to further progress. Second, the Palmdale statement failed in a more significant way by acknowledging the points made by both sides without apparently attempting to reconcile them. Gerhard Fandel again would later note that because of the fuzzy wording of some of the passages in the Palmdale statement, quote, both sides could claim that the statement supports their position, end quote. This, I would suggest, is the most significant failure of the Palmdale statement. It, th that consensus uh, wasn't, wasn't meaningful in promoting understanding. If both sides can walk away saying, I gave up nothing and I was in the statement vindicated me, then clearly something went wrong. Now, the Palmdale conference made progress, right? But it ultimately failed to solve the controversy over righteousness by faith, which is what it was called to attempt to do. Even more alarming, this controversy quickly became about much more than righteousness by faith. Maybe it was about right, it was about more than righteousness by faith all along. It was about two notions, two different notions of what it means to be an Adventist, how we view the nature of Christ, how we view the end times, how we relate to the world outside of the church. Are we friends with the evangelicals? Are we not friends with the evangelicals? So, um, because both sides were connected to these, these equally large issues, it became really difficult to address the issue at hand because there's, there was more to it than just justification and sanctification. And so... You know, it was inevitable. Even if Palmdale had made a great deal of progress, there would still be friction between the Adventism that was represented by Ken Wood and the Adventism that was represented by Desmond Ford, because inevitably, so long as the larger issues remained, these two tribes in the church would find another issue to clash on. And spoiler alert, that's where all of these episodes are headed. So the third reason that Palmdale ultimately failed is that it was dealing with, I don't want to say it was a superficial issue, a surface issue, because righteousness by faith is an incredibly important issue. Um, but there was a larger issue, and, and I think that issue was, what, it, what is Adventism? What does it mean to be an Adventist? And until that was dealt with, because, you know, again, uh, as we'll get into here, is Jesus our model man? 
Is he somebody who, after we have that experience of justification, we're meant to live our lives of perfect obedience like he did? Um, it, are we looking for the last days living without a mediator? If so, then yes, I need to focus on making sure sin is all rooted out of my life. And of course, what is sin? Do we have original sin? Is sin merely the actions, the thoughts, the choices we make? Or is there a nature of sin that that uh, you know we're not going to overcome? We can't give that part up. That's a superficial action on God's part. Anyways, you're, you're, you're getting what I'm saying, I hope, that there was this was connected, this debate was connected to all of these other issues. And less the larger bundle of issues is dealt with, which ultimately I believe comes down to what does it mean to be an Adventist? Then, then you can address this one issue all you want. It's, it's not going to change anything in the end. Now, in the aftermath of Palmdale, it seems that pundits gave a slight victory to the progressive side on the issue of righteousness by faith. Ray Martin who had been affiliated with Brinsmead's ideas, he declared, quote, Fords was the strong voice of the conference, in it, and he swung the thinking his way. One by one, the brethren conceded that his position was unassailable from a biblical and exegetical standpoint, end quote. Even Russell Standish, on the other side, conceded that, quote, Pastor Pearson's effort to resolve the escalation of the new theology crisis in Australia failed at the subsequent Palmdale, California conference, end quote. Robert Brinsmead said that the, quote, joint statement seems to give cautious consent that the Australian viewpoint is at least technically correct, end quote. Returning to Australia, Ford briefed the students and faculty of Avondale about what had happened at Palmdale in two chapel talks. Now, keep in mind when he delivers these chapel talks, the consensus statement had not been published yet, so everyone's eager to find out from people who were there what happened? What were the results? Nobody knows yet until the consensus statement is published. On May 18th, Ford took the stand and said that Palmdale reflected a break with the Avenus past. He told those in the chapel that many had the attitude that, quote, anything said by former leaders of the church becomes automatically canonical and creedal. Well, that just isn't so, end quote. Ford wrote a letter to a friend and declared, Quote, we made a plain statement that righteousness by faith means justification, end quote. Encouraged by his apparent vindication at Palmdale, Des accepted invitations across Australia, New Zealand, and even Fiji to share the gospel. Now, Des had good reason to believe that Palmdale was a victory, because the progressives have gotten the traditionalists to admit that Paul's phrase, righteousness by faith, meant justification. Curiously, Des seemed even more excited about what the Palmdale Statement said about 1888. He wrote, quote, The most significant thing is the fact that the report is very clear that we missed out in 1888 in almost all our published reports of Minneapolis, gloss over this matter, and try to make it some sort of victory. End quote. And that sounds exactly like something Robert Wieland would have written. Why does Des care about 1888? My thought is that it enabled him to position his message, the gospel that he was proclaiming, as, uh, as, as Wheeland and others had done, as the message that had been rejected in 1888, where the church had gone astray, and now by reclaiming this message, we can get back on course. In fact, this connection between Wheeland and Des, who, by the way, did not have a whole lot of other things in common necessarily, but there is a connection on this point, and Des asked, we asked for Wheeland and Short's manuscript months after Palmdale, which seems to indicate that he realized that they were on the same page, at least on this point. And it's curious that he calls this, this passage about 1888 the most significant thing about the Palmdale statement. Now, if Des had gained some concessions from the other side at Palmdale when it came to the meaning of righteousness by faith and when it came to 1888, what did he have to give up? Nothing of value, it seemed. He admitted that outside of Paul, the word righteousness on its own can refer to sanctification. And he accepted that Avenus had traditionally used righteousness by faith to mean justification and sanctification. Acknowledging that historical facts cost him nothing when the first paragraphs of the statement made it clear that the tradition was wrong in how 
uh, in light of how Paul used the phrase righteousness by faith. So even if Avanus had said righteousness by faith is sanctification plus justification, what does that matter to admit that that happened when the statement also admits that when Paul uses the phrase, he means justification only. So therefore, should we not as Avanus look at how Paul used the phrase and say, well, we want to be biblical. We are, not going to, we are now going to stop using righteousness by faith to mean sanctification as well. Let's confine it to justification alone, just as Paul did. Now, Ray Martin reported that, quote, back in Washington, D.C., there was a feeling that the Palmdale statement gave too much toward Dr. Ford's view and that it needed altering before its publication, end quote. Now, that Sounds like typical church gossip. I don't know if it's true or not, but these are the sort of things that were flying around at that time. Palmdale then seemed like a win, but Des was circumspect about the fact that it wasn't a final victory. As he counseled a friend, quote, this was a report of a committee of men with diverse viewpoints. We cannot expect them to go too fast. We can be grateful for what is done and pray that the rest may be done, end quote. Ford was cautiously optimistic that Palmdale was the start of the church coming around to his views, which he thought were the biblical views. One Oklahoma reader of the review praised the publication of the Palmdale statement, quote, I have never seen such a significant article in the review, end quote. Another from California wrote, quote, I believe this to be the most cogent, all-encompassing treatise on the subject of righteousness by faith I have yet read, end quote. Still another wrote, quote, the article was like a breath of fresh spring air. Too long have we colored justification by faith with our human, perfectionistic, sinless glasses, end quote. And so you can see some of the readers of the review were very excited to have the Palmdale statement published, and at least that last one there was saw it as a victory for the progressive side. The honeymoon, like I said earlier, was short-lived. Because throughout the Aussie winter of 1976, or the American summer, John Clifford and Russell Standish traveled widely, explaining their views of righteousness by faith to anyone who would listen. Rather than solving the debate, Palmdale seemed to give fresh fuel for both sides. This was abundantly clear, Uh, on October 21 in this issue of the Avenus Review because Ken Wood used his editorial powers to weigh in on Palmdale. The whole point of Palmdale, Wood told his readers, was to, quote, clarify terminologies, share insights, and encourage further study, end quote. The fact that Wood was here six months later endeavoring to put several matters in better perspective, as he put it, is further evidence that Palmdale wasn't entirely successful in clarifying things. Wood began his FYI article by acknowledging some letters he had received over the summer months, and that is summer in North America. A man from Tennessee had been struck by the seeming incongruity of the Palmdale statement, which at once asserted that Paul uses righteousness by faith to mean justification, while it acknowledges that Avenus have traditionally used the phrase to mean justification and sanctification. So how can you say Paul uses it to mean justification, but Avenus have used it to mean both? How do we reconcile this? The man from Tennessee asked, quote, Why should we use the expression to mean something that was not intended by Scripture? What will our Protestant friends who read our literature think of us when we include sanctification in righteousness by faith? A mighty reformation took place in the 16th century through the preaching of justification by faith alone. Do we expect to see another reformation by preaching 90% sanctification and 10% justification? End quote. Wood made it clear that at Palmdale there was, quote, no disagreement on whether salvation comes solely through the merits of Christ, nor was there disagreement on the necessity for sanctification, end quote. Wood was clearly suggesting that rumors of any significant disagreement were unfounded, but he also used his FYI article to claim that the SDA Encyclopedia supports the view that righteousness by faith is justification plus sanctification, and that, quote, the Palmdale Statement concurs with this view, end quote. But Wood then went on to muddy the water. Quote, although we are justified by the merits of the blood of Christ and through the instrument of faith, it, all, it is also true that works of loving obedience are the evidence of saving faith. 
In the last judgment, our works in love testified to the reality of justifying faith and our union with Christ. End quote. So, Wood is echoing the most muddled aspect of the Palmdale Statement, which also asserted that our works testified to the reality of justifying faith. He's using language from the Palmdale Statement there. And that these works uh, testify to our justifying faith, our, our, our state of being justified in the final judgment. What does it mean to say that our works testify to our justification in the final judgment? Perhaps Russell Standish can help us out. Labeling the progressives as adherents of a new theology, we heard that phrase earlier, and you'll still hear it today among some, some people. Standish wrote, quote, Those accepting the new theology proclaim that it is impossible to keep God's law fully, even when filled with the Holy Spirit, while those holding to the old Adventist beliefs assert that it is not only possible, but mandatory, end quote. Traditionalists like Standish, and would believe that justification should mean something. The Spirit's presence in our lives should mean something in terms of moving us toward real holiness. And so one might take Wood and the Palmdale statement to mean that without good works, there is no evidence of justification, and thus we might not be saved in the end. We need good works driven by the Spirit and by God's grace, okay? None of them would ever say we, we get these good works on our own. We need them to testify to the reality of justifying faith in order to be saved. In other words, we're not saved by works, but we won't be saved without them. Or as one evangelical summarized the Reformation, we are saved by faith alone, but not by faith that is alone. And the reason why I call this muddled is, is not because it's... Um, I guess instantly wrong. It's just, it depends what you mean by these words. Because there's a real fine line here, right? Between saying, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. By God's grace, we reproduce these works that we need in order to stand in the final judgment. That's a real fine line between that and we need to do good works in order to be saved. Real fine line. You know, is that adding by God's grace element, is it a, a meaningful addition? Does it change anything, or is it just a fig leaf we put over the fact that we want to work our way to heaven? And so this is a this is a little knot in this cord that needs to be untied and understood, because it just really depends on what one means by these words. And uh, anyways, Wood, Wood had no problem conceding to Ford that Paul's phrase, righteousness by faith, refers to justification alone, because he and his fellow traditionalists were focused on the larger biblical picture, which, as the Palmdale statement said, the larger issue of righteousness also concerns sanctification as well as justification. So what worried Wood was that one might take Paul's phrase and apply it everywhere in Scripture. Quote, if Paul is referring to the experience of justification when he uses the expression righteousness by faith, then use the expression the way he uses it, follow sound exegetical principles. End quote. Now, Kenneth Wood wasn't done with his FYI article. He added a stunning claim that was sure to provoke the progressives. Quote, we think it only fair to say, however, that those who hold sanctification to be a part of righteousness by faith seem to place greater emphasis on holy living than do those who exclude it. They seem to give greater emphasis to humanity's part in cooperating with divinity in the plan of salvation. End quote. Now, this must have sounded mighty cheeky to Des Ford, who, as we've seen in past episodes, was just a scrup just as scrupulous a Sabbath keeper and a health message advocate as any other Adventist in his day. Surely, Wood wasn't suggesting that Ford downplayed holy living, was he? Wood seemed to back off this claim at the end of the article by saying, quote, It is unfair to accuse people who defined righteousness by faith merely as justification as of being unconcerned about holy living. End quote. So they weren't unconcerned, merely less concerned? Wood added, quote, It is unfair to try and put a saved by works label on people who believe that Christ's efforts to sanctify them and fit them for heaven may be included in the expression righteousness by faith. End quote. Again, this just shows how confusing this whole conversation is. Palmdale, not to mention Wood himself, earlier in the same article, accepted that righteousness by faith 
a phrase coined by Paul meant justification. Wood himself, earlier in this article, agreed that the Palmdale statement, quote, implies the need for using precise language in articulating the church's teaching on righteousness by faith, end quote. So, he agrees that the phrase in Paul, the phrase righteousness by faith that Paul uses means justification, and he agreed that we need to have precise language in the church to articulate what righteousness by faith is and that we need to be biblical in doing so. How one reconciles this, I don't know, because he still insisted on using righteousness by faith to mean justification and sanctification. Des Ford chimed in, of course, reiterating his position that, quote, God justifies no one whom he does not proceed to sanctify immediately, end quote. However, Ford added, quote, while the gift of justification comes by faith alone as a free gift, this is not the case with sanctification, where human effort is always called for, end quote. Because human effort is called for in sanctification, it cannot be part of the righteousness that comes by faith. Ford concluded, quote, Could it be that we have not given justification the place it should have in order to break the hearts of those who hear the gospel? It is the proclamation of God's amnesty in Christ which brings revival, and reformation can proceed only after the foundation has been laid. End quote. Another progressive was less diplomatic in his letter to Wood. Quote, I believe that it is grossly unfair to say that those who hold sanctification to be a part of righteousness by faith seem to place a greater emphasis on holy living than do those who exclude it. They may seem to, but things are not always what they seem to be. End quote. Now, Wood was back the next week with FYI Part 2. In his second article, Wood made a couple of points that are worth summarizing. First, that there's a difference between salvation by works and salvation by sanctification. Salvation by works is when we try to earn our way to heaven. Salvation by sanctification is when we, justified by the blood of Christ, allow the Holy Spirit to transform us and make us fit for heaven. Second, Wood claimed that while Martin Luther reintroduced us to justification, he was not entirely free from the mindset of salvation by works. Neither, Wood admitted, were early Adventists. Tracing this thought throughout history, Wood could assert with Ellen White that restoring the true meaning of righteousness by faith, that is, justification and sanctification in his view, is the core aspect of the Adventist message. Wood was back a week later with part three of his FYI series, where he aimed to unpack the importance of sanctification in relation to justification. Again, let's be brief here. Wood points out that, quote, contrary to the impression that some may have, the 1888 message in no way taught that justification is the entire gospel or that justification eliminates the need for sanctification, end quote. I don't know who had that misconception that the entire gospel was justification, but consider yourself corrected. Wood went on, quote, we think it is, it is important to understand that the gospel, good news, is not merely an announcement of what Christ has done in the past to save a lost world. It is an announcement of what Christ wants to do and is able to do in the present, end quote. Again, I don't know who would have disagreed with that statement, but I think Wood worded it that way because many of the traditionalists understood justification as forgiveness of past sins alone. For future sins, you have sanctification. And so therefore, he says that the gospel is not just an announcement of what Christ has done in the past, but what he is doing today and what he will do in the future. Because they saw justification as entirely concerned with forgiving the things you had done wrong in the past. We need to keep in mind that justification, Wood says, is just a useful figure of speech describing vindication in a courtroom. As such, It only reveals one angle of salvation. Wood then went after the progressives when he argued that, quote, we must avoid the feeling that our choice of language in presenting the gospel is the only acceptable choice. We must not get hung up on shibboleths, even one as beautiful as righteousness by faith. We must not insist that unless others use the legal language of justification by faith, they are not preaching the gospel, end quote. In other words, Wood portrayed progressives like Ford as being too focused on the technical meaning of Paul's concept of righteousness by faith, Wood even quoted Ellen White, who told ministers at one point to stop squabbling over minute points of view. 
She said, quote, away with this egotism, end quote. Now, Wood didn't mention Ford by name, of course, but there was no way to disguise this stunning, strident assertion that Ford was stirring everybody up over a mere, meaningless turn of phrase, and it's all because of his ego. Of course, it took two sides to argue over what righteousness by faith meant, okay? But Wood was positioning the progressives as nitpickers and naysayers. Colin and Russell Standish took the same line of attack when they said that Brinsmead's followers were quote, less ego involved, end quote, than Ford's followers. There was a fourth and final part to Wood's FYI series, released in November 18th, 1976. This one focused on two issues. First, the content of the 1888 message being superior to the Protestant Reformation. Wood repeated Adventism's long-held belief that they are the true heirs of the Reformation, finishing what Wycliffe and Huss and Luther had started. As such, the 1888 message represents the best light on the subject of righteousness by faith that human beings have. Wood's second point concerned the nature of Christ. Wood defended the Palmdale Statement's cautious approach to this question, arguing that the nature of Christ is a mystery and it's reasonable for reasonable people to disagree. Nevertheless, Wood made his case that the 1888 message included the view that Jesus came in sinful human flesh and yet overcame sin. Wood's four FYI editorials on the Palmdale Statement constituted an updated response to the progressives from one of the most prestigious institutions of the church, the Adventist Review. If Ford had achieved the concession by getting the Palmdale delegates to admit that Paul had justification, not sanctification, in mind, then Wood's FYI editorials made it plain that this concession was considered meaningless. It quickly became clear that Palmdale wasn't quite the concession of Ford that it first appeared to be, and this was driven home in a response to Ford's letter to the editor, where Ford had reminded his readers that Palmdale agreed that righteousness by faith, quote, means justification and justification only, end quote. Ford italicized this word only. And then A.J. Clifford and Russell Standish replied, quote, the word only is neither used nor implied, end quote, in the Palmdale Statement. And they were right about that. The Palmdale Statement only said that Paul used righteousness by faith to mean justification, but not justification only. Russell and Colin Standish saw it too. Quote, when the first sentence of the Palmdale Consensus was read, it provided a most tantalizing problem for those who accepted the new theology in Australia. Superficially, it looked so close to their pet theory, end quote. Now, it was reasonable for Ford, I think, and others to assume that this is what the language meant because they knew what they meant when they argued for this point to be included in the statement. But for people who weren't at Palmdale, who could analyze every word, the lack of that word only, a word of great importance to the Protestant reformers, means that both sides could agree that Paul meant justification without giving up anything. In other words, it wasn't a concession at all. Ray Martin realized this when he wrote, quote, maybe Ford failed to sew up his case at Palmdale when he did not include the word alone in that vital paragraph on the biblical meaning of righteousness by faith. The sola was the offense of the Reformation. Maybe it is the offense of Adventism today, end quote. Des's friend, Lowell Tarling, began to despair. Quote, frankly, I'm sick of the whole Clifford Standish business. I was so optimistic that they would see their errors if you stood up and publicly proclaimed them. But it just didn't happen that way. Humanly speaking, I don't think the light will shine any brighter on the doctors, and what they can't see now, no human being will be able to make them see at all. I've been too optimistic, and I was wrong. End quote. By the time Tarling wrote those words, Russell Standish and John Clifford had more widely disseminated their manuscript. Conflicting Concepts was out. In case you don't have a copy of Conflicting Concepts with you right this very moment, let me tell you just a little bit about it. The main thrust of Conflicting concept is that men like Desmond Ford and Robert Brinsmead represented a foreign liberal Adventism that is at odds with Adventist history. To quote Standish and Clifford, quote, we cannot afford to overlook the fact that modern Seventh-day Adventist liberalism in the Australian church 
has been in, largely introduced into the movement by theologians from Avondale College, end quote. How did this happen? Well, our authors tell us, in part because men like Ford have been trained at what the authors call worldly theological institutions. The authors are particularly incensed by Ford's constant appeals to evangelical scholars as authorities in settling exegetical questions. Now, I interviewed one gentleman who I'll have the occasion to mention again when we get to Glacier View, and he told me he first heard of Ford while reading the Palmdale papers that had been published by Jack D. Walker in Avenus in Tennessee. This gentleman was a teenager at the time, but he said, quote, the first impression I got was very negative because Ford spent pages and pages in these documents quoting from evangelical scholars, end quote. The authors of conflicting concepts preferred to call such scholars in Avenist apocalyptic parlance, quote, apostate Protestants, end quote. The real threat of worldliness, of liberalism, is that it effectively delays our Lord's coming, the authors tell us. While conflicting concepts was focused on the topic of righteousness by faith, the authors saw this as only one battlefield among many, where a war was being waged against the truth. These other battlefields included, in case you're wondering, the infallibility of the Bible, the sanctuary doctrine, and the age of the earth being said to be older than 6,000 years. Now, it's not clear to me if Des was aware that Russell, Standish, and John Clifford's conflicting concepts was at Palmdale. A month after Palmdale, Des was informed that he was supposed to have gotten a copy of conflicting concepts back in April, but that this first copy apparently never arrived. Standish claimed that he had sent one to Brinsmead and Ford at the same time he sent three copies to Palmdale. Nevertheless, Ford was interested in seeing it, but he predicted, quote, I doubt very much that I would bother about trying to answer it, end quote. As the concerned brethren kept campaigning for their interpretation of Palmdale, Ford couldn't avoid conflicting concepts. Des, together with the Aussie branch of the Biblical Research Institute, declared, quote, We believe in the great earnestness of Brethren Standish and Clifford, but we do not believe in their thoroughness. We would urge these brethren to forsake their practice of superficial research and hasty conclusions, end quote. The first versions of conflicting concepts did indeed have a number of errors, such as claiming Des had a middle initial, which he didn't. Standish and Clifford really messed up when they labeled the book a Biblical Research Institute paper. This is what earned the ire of the Aussie Biblical Research Institute. Standish explained that since his book was being sent to Palmdale, and because he fully intended to present it to the GC Biblical Research Institute, he therefore called it a BRI paper. I suppose he means it is a BRI paper in the sense that it was submitted to the BRI? Well, the Aussie BRI, run by a Ford colleague, nevertheless understandably did not buy this explanation, which many saw as an act of deception by trying to pass conflicting concepts off as an official denominational paper. The Aussie BRI wrote to Clifford and Standish that they couldn't call it a BRI paper until it had been approved by the BRI, which they believed Clifford and Standish knew very, very well. Quote, to present your material as a biblical institute paper is to tacitly claim our consideration and approval of it, which, I repeat, you well know is not the case. I reiterate, therefore, I marvel at your audacity, end quote. Russell Standish would later downplay the affair, complaining that, quote, this triviality was seized upon to bring heavy attack upon the manuscript. No doubt, the obvious anger that was displayed in the letter had little to do with the use of the term. The reaction was seen as an objection which could be exploited in order to discredit the entire manuscript without the necessity of answering the difficult questions that were posed, end quote. Now, there may have been some truth to that, or maybe not, but a later letter reveals a baser reason, because our authors write, quote, The reason we did emphasize the truth that the manuscript was a Biblical Research Institute paper was to avoid following the unprecedented action of Dr. Ford in freely distributing, as a matter of final truth, his wife's document and several of his own without going through the denominational procedures, end quote. Okay. So because they didn't like how Des Ford had put some books, uh, one by his wife and several by himself, in the university bookstore, I imagine, but without getting uh, approval from someone somewhere, they decided, well, we're going to show you how it should be done, and we're going to send it for approval and make a show of sending it for approval, right? This is submitted to the BRI. This is not something we're just sneaking out there. 
Okay. Despite this drama, conflicting concepts wasn't going away. It had legs for some reason. And in one of his replies to, uh, to this topic, Des would sigh, quote, the gospel has its critics despite its being such good news, end quote. Now, I'm going to have more to say about conflicting concepts in our next episode, but it's important to understand that no matter what Ken Wood or Russell Standish or John Clifford wrote in the months following Palmdale, the event that impacted Ford the most actually happened on October 18th, 1976. That's when R.R. Frame, Australasian Division President, took a job at the General Conference overseeing what later became the Adventist Media Center in Thousand Oaks, California. The Des had enjoyed a great relationship with Frame, and Elsie Naden, his predecessor before him. The rumor going around, and again, it's a rumor, was that Frame wasn't up for managing the theological firestorm that had been consuming Australia that year. Now Frame's successor was, in fact, the secretary of the division, Keith Parmenter. No one was quite sure where Parmenter would land. Ray Martin thought he was against the Standishes, but also against Brinsmead, Martin noted that some younger pastors, quote, are becoming impatient and often repeat Froome's famous saying, we need more funerals to get Adventism going, end quote. <laughs> you know what? I've heard a version of this my entire Adventist life. I didn't, I didn't know that it was associated with Froome. Some were wishing that Parmenter would be uh, an authoritarian leader who might overplay his hand against Fords and so make a martyr out of him. That would give the cause the fire that it needed. But Ray Martin was more circumspect when he wrote, quote, Those aware of the issues wonder what is in store for Dr. Ford now that Elder Frame has left. Time alone will tell. End quote. Spoiler alert, it wouldn't take much time to find out where Keith Parmenter stood. And we're going to figure that out in the next episode. If you want to hear more about this issue of Righteousness by Faith, there will be some Avenus History Extra episodes coming out in the near future. I promised you one last time. Uh, I had another few pages of notes that I cut out of this episode that I thought, well, I'll add that to this uh, extra episode. And it's just lots of material, lots of quotes that I didn't get around to adding here because this is already a fairly long episode. So if you want to listen to more of this, we want to understand this issue better, I'd encourage you to go become a patron or head over to the AdventistHistoryPodcast.org website to get access to Adventist History Extra today, especially if you want to get into, into this subject some more. But we got a great back catalog of subjects and interviews as well for you. Thanks so much for listening, my friends. I know your time is valuable. I know it's valuable. And I am very grateful that you decided to spend it with me today. We'll see you next time. Hey, it's me again. If this episode didn't quench your desire for more Avenus History content, then go subscribe to Avenus History Extra. It's a private podcast that I do for those who support the Avenus History Project. You can get access to Avenus History Extra on the website, which is AvenusHistoryProject.org or by becoming a patron at patreon.com. Now, there's more variety at Avenus History Extra, in case you were wondering. I do some interviews. Sometimes I do bonus episodes. You know, I, we had a good episode here in the Avenus History Podcast, and I want to talk some more about it. Other times, I go behind the scenes at conferences I attend, like the Women in Seventh-day Adventist History Conference. What's more, just as a second announcement for you, Michael Campbell and I are leading a bus tour in October 2024. So if you want to go drive around New England a bit, see the, see the sights and have some fun, well, you can sign up for our bus tour newsletter, once again, at AdventistHistoryProject.org. And we're going to keep you up to date there about what you need to know to go and sign up for that and all of that. So just to be very, 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 very clear, we don't have a sign up for the bus tour itself but it's a sign up for the newsletter so you can stay informed about the bus tour so I don't have to make announcements every single time and interrupt these episodes and all of that. That's where those announcements are going to be. So if you're interested, head on over to the website. You can sign up for the bus tour newsletter over there. Okay, I think that about does it. Thanks again for listening.